Let's Podcast alongside Joe Giglio. I'm Joe Ovias, live to tape, Eford Studios, Empire Properties in downtown Raleigh. Wait, wait, on a Friday, Joe? What's going on here? It's a holiday week. Yeah. I feel good. I like our flexibility here. That is one thing I had to explain to Kelly earlier this week. She's like, well, I'm like, because we can. It's the yeah. summer. We'll figure this stuff out. Yeah. When we get to football season, we'll probably add another show because we can. Right. Plus, I think we have to fit in all the advertisers at some point. Isn't that the real reason why we're going to add a show? Nah. That's totally the reason why we're adding another show once we get to football season. Oh, yeah, yeah. We got a lot of shows going on. We got a lot of shows going on because thankfully the support for the podcast has been uh, great. We appreciate everybody who has subscribed to the podcast on YouTube. People who have given it five stars on your favorite podcasting platforms. Thanks for following there. The social media love. There it is. Social media love. There it is. I can't tell you how big that is. Went yesterday to see our friends at Breeze Through. Mm -hmm. And Adam says to me, he goes, I, I just can't get over the number of people on social media who are like, oh, I saw you. I, I, I didn't know about you. When you when you personalize that message to the, the person who tweeted about going to the breeze through and seeing the beer cave yes. and seeing the crawlers. Yes. Like you, we can't pay you enough for that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. So thank you. Well, I mean, the best I can do is send you stickers. Uh, and we got cups on the way as well. So anyway, all this to say, uh, as we're two months into this thing and we're getting ready for the football season. Uh, thanks to everybody who has, honestly, for lack of a better term, done their part to help us. And hopefully that'll continue once we go into the football season. And I think the reason why people are enjoying what we're doing or gravitating to what we're doing is because we continue to be local. You've been here a long time. I've been here a long time. And there's still a desire to have local content from people who have been around for a while, who can contextualize things that have happened in the triangle for a long time. And it's not just for people who have grown up here and have been around NC State, Carolina, Duke, the big four and professional sports for a long time. I think it actually speaks to people who are moving to the area as well, who want to kind of get with what this area is about to understand why people care about these rivalries and everything else. And, and it, maybe this is just kind of a, a sappy, long-winded way of getting to the passing of Dick Sheridan, former NC State football coach uh, who was 81 years old. Dick Sheridan was the coach at NC State from 1986 through 1992, the 1992 season. And then he kind of abruptly retired. He resigned in June of 1993, and he never coached again. Uh, the health concerns were the reason given back in 1993. And this isn't so much about NC State and Dick Sheridan, who, if you talk to any old time NC State fan, they will say nothing but great things about Dick Sheridan. And they will kind of get misty eyed talking about that time of college football in that era. And the reason why I find it interesting is it really speaks to just how much college football has changed nationally and how much college football has changed locally from the time when Dick Sheridan was the head coach of the Wolfpack. It's hard to wrap your brain around how much college football has changed. It's nuts, man. And keep in mind, so my freshman year at NC State is the Michael Caine's first year. So I missed all of this. Mm -hmm. But you can piece together stories and everything else. You said health reasons. I think it's fair. I'm not going to slander the dead here on this day. Sure. But I think it is fair to say that Dick Sheridan, head football coach, who was hired by Jim Valvano, and Todd Turner, who had become the AD in the post Valvano era, mm -hmm. who was specifically hired to quote unquote clean up mm -hmm. NC State athletics. There was a major personality clash between those two people. I, I think it's fair to say that. Yeah, I don't think that's okay. I don't think that's an unfair thing. And to I say. We, see, we see this time all, time and time again. Roy everywhere. Williams at Kansas yep. and, and finally coming back to Carolina. Bingo. So I, I think it's fair to say that is the primary reason. Now, it, was there health issue, concerns for Dick? age 51 when he actually retired mm -hmm. i'm sure there was but he never coached again which would I, indicate to me maybe that was the case but regardless i do think the primary reason was the the personality clash yeah and the differences in opinion between todd turner and dick sheridan that being said we are going to have a hard time putting ourselves in the mindset of acc football keep in mind now in 1986 when dick sheridan was hired mm -hmm. And, and I'll, you're going to play a clip yeah. from YouTube from Jim Valvano in 86. This is during the Clemson game. And remember now, Valvano, in addition to being the head basketball coach yeah. and a tour de force yes. in a personality, yeah. was also the athletic director at NC State. It was not uncommon in the 80s mm -hmm. for 
but Bo Schembechler, Michigan, uh, off the top of my head, comes to mind. It was not unpopular. It was fairly common practice for the biggest coach on campus to also be the athletic director because, again, it's hard for us to unpiece what the machines that are athletic departments now, mm -hmm. what they were then. You need a CEO now. Yes. That's what you it's need. It's totally different, right? So here's this clip. This is from 1986. Mm -hmm. This is Jim Valvano with Brent and Musburger on CBS Sports. Now, I, okay, now let me give you two more con pieces of context here, <laughs> on okay? CBS Sports. I'm going to give you two more pieces of context. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. in 86, I don't think there was... There may have been ESPN games, but there was one a week, yeah. if that. And yeah. it was at night, I believe. Yeah, okay? I think you're right. So the only other time for you to watch college football nationally was the CBS game of the week. Mm -hmm. And when Brent Musburger came to your town in 1986, mm -hmm. it was a big effing deal. Oh, yeah. And it did not have... Florida State, keep in mind, in 86 is an independent. Miami in 86, independent. Mm -hmm. Penn State, independent. Okay, Notre Dame, obviously an independent. These are all the teams who were running hot. I'm not saying Alabama. I'm not yeah. saying LSU. I'm not saying Georgia. Keep in mind of the teams I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma, Nebraska, Penn State, Miami, Florida State. Those were the big teams. You mentioned Miami and Brett Musburger. I associate the yes. 80s and the early 90s with Brent Musburger and Miami. At the Orange Bowl or calling a Miami Notre Dame game. Yes. You are looking live. So this was a huge deal for NC State. Mm -hmm. That's number one mm -hmm. that for this game to be on CBS, it just didn't happen. Number two, okay. Dick Sheridan was hired because NC State was in this three and eight rut under Tom Reed. Okay. Tom Reed was head coach for three years, 83, 84, 85. Okay. Re remember now in the ACC, there's no Florida State. Right. Okay. Georgia Tech is here, so it's an eight team league, but there's no Florida State. Okay. The national power or, or what the closest thing to a national power in the ACC and the team that was running rough shot was Clemson. Mm -hmm. Okay. NC State in this three and eight rut in 84 loses to a one double A team, Furman. You're thinking, huh? Okay. Well, that maybe that kind of happens. Now, remember, again, using your, your, not using your 2023 brain. Yeah. One double A teams and one A teams didn't play that often back then because every game you wanted to play, you wanted to sell, to sell tickets for it. It wasn't about TV, it was about selling tickets. So you rarely played one double A teams. Dick Sheridan comes to Raleigh, 84, beats NC State. And you're like, well, maybe that was fluky. Tom Reed can't coach. Okay, 34-30. The next year comes back to Carter-Finley <laughs> Stadium, 42-20. to 20. Absolutely puts it on mm -hmm. NC State. This was no going to the big house and blocking a kick and, you know, <laughs> all that other stuff. This right. was my team is superior yeah. to yours. And we just kicked your ass. With, with you know, at the time, the scholarship li limit probably wasn't 80 and 50 because there was no scholarship limits, remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there but there's a difference. <laughs> but still, there was a difference. There's a difference. Right? They came in and they absolutely ran state out of the building. Jim Valvano, by all accounts, is one of the smartest people who, whoever was, right? Sure. Just brilliant and, and certainly in the context of sports. Looks at that and goes, I know who I need to hire. <laughs> As my football coach. <laughs> and I know who can make some hay here in the ACC. And then that sets up this yeah. clip with Valvano joining the broadcast crew of CBS. It's uh, Brett Musburger, Era Procedion. And again, they're playing Clemson at home in, a, in a, one of the rarest of rare national spotlight games for NC State. In Raleigh, North Carolina, 24 3, North Carolina State. And Era, the athletic Mascots director, are taking all the credit in the world. Jim Valvano has just joined us. Nice hiring, Jim. I don't want to say I told you so, but I did talk to the coach last night and remember mentioning about a reverse. Didn't I say that, guy? That's right, exactly right. And I said the perfect time it would come, a little nail in the coffin. I know Coach Sheridan like to hear you say that. There's a lot of football to go. But what a fantastic job. Dick Sheridan's the best football coach in the country. You know, I thought you were the Pope coming up here. Look at all It's my folks. Hey! Everybody! Up! 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 Everybody up! Let's hear it! We got it! They're the best! They're the best! First down, and here comes Flagler. So, both islands are just covering the run. I would like to mention that Dick Sheridan won a high school state basketball championship. And that's, I mean, 
and there we're talking. That's the credentials now, now, you need. Now, now, you're telling me that anybody who can coach basketball can come out here and coach hey, plays that? It certainly yeah. helps. You know, Coach Corsi just told me he had a little basketball back then, too. Is that right, Coach? That's right. You're a great recruiter for football coaches. <laughs> So that that's a bit of the clip and uh, shout out to the pack fan STK who had uploaded that onto YouTube. You can find that YouTube. Just look up NC State Clemson uh, 1986 and you can probably watch most of the game mm -hmm. uh, that's on that YouTube clip. Regardless. Um, yeah. Different time F from everything from the graphics to, as you mentioned, uh, how college football got on television, the old double wide in the sky. There was a quaintness to it that I yes. understand that people kind of want to gravitate to. And I think that quaintness also shows itself in the records, right? I was going to say, maybe to, maybe to illustrate your point that what fans were happy with and what they weren't happy with. We've Remember been having yesterday this conversation we a about, lot. Yeah, we talked about James Franklin yesterday. Yep. And he keeps saying, I'm going to I'm going to the Rose Bowl. I'm going to you know, New Year's six games. I'm just not getting into the playoff and winning a championship. Like, what you, else do you want? What do you want? <laughs> Look, the college football playoff has completely wrecked what fans want or expect or what they desire out of college football. And you and I are old enough to remember a time in which getting to the Peach Bowl was a big freaking deal. So in the seven seasons that Dick Sheridan went to NC State, he only had one losing season. That was the second year, four and seven. The only time they missed a bowl. But he went to three Peach Bowls and a Gator Bowl. Now, one of those Peach Bowls was in 1991, which happened to be against ECU. And they lose 25-24. That, that was his best team. It was also the best team in ECU's school history. I was trying to because you said nine and three was the record. You just kind of looked at it like, uh, got to remember though that was an eleven game. It was schedule. eleven game season, so he went nine and two. Well, I wasn't. I wasn't. That's pretty good. No, but I wasn't going. Uh, I, was sitting, I was sitting here looking at this, going, yeah, nine and two, nine and two, uh, eight and two. Like, regardless, my my point had been and will continue to be that college football at that time that was good enough. That th that Peach Bowl that I brought up. If you talk to anybody who's older than us. Yeah, they will fondly remember going to the Peach Bowl being a big deal. Now, you bring up the ECU game, the inverse happens where ECU fans who are big Steve Logan fans will sit there and tell you all about like, hey, remember that time of the Peach Bowl? We got you. It's still something that gets brought up. And it's just a reminder that for 98% of college football programs, this is good. But the college football playoff has completely screwed everything. And while Dick Sheridan was before my time, I know the line of demarcation of when football became big business at NC State. And that was the coach that followed the coach who followed Dick Sheridan. Because, yeah, Michael Kane. Michael Kane comes in. An assistant for Dick Sheridan at Furman and at NC State. Yes. And Michael Kane was fine. But you know what Michael Kane didn't do? Did not beat Carolina. You know what Dick Sheridan did? <laughs> Always, yes. Six and one against the Six and one, Eels. including the last five. OK, yeah. so when you don't beat Carolina, well, that's going to become a problem. Michael Caine couldn't consistently do it. Mac Brown was on the rise at the time to it at North Carolina. But I always view Chuck Amato coming through as the line of demarcation of when football became serious here, when mm -hmm. football really started to turn the corner in money, expectations, the capital investment at Carter Finley Stadium also really started. Now, it's not just all Chuck Amato's credit. OK, Marianne Fox, the chance for the time came from a football crazed state. And she wanted to bring that to, and she kind of understood where the money was going. So let's get serious about it. And they brought Chuck Amato in. And we've been in this kind of arms race between state and Carolina since. Of course, the results are largely the same between the two schools. But again, you see that arms race between the two starting around that time. Yeah, that's the other thing that's hard to reconcile in 1986. Mm -hmm. Football way down here in the oh, ACC. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Basketball. Way up here at 86. Think about 86, mm -hmm. right? Yes. You had the heels win the thing, 82. State win the thing, 83. Duke play for the thing for the first time under K, yeah. 86. Valvano's at the double wide in the sky. He's the celeb. Yes. He's the one who's just come off a national championship a couple of years prior yes. to that. So, yes, he's the biggest star there is in the state because of the personality. You missed out on that time, by the way. I did, man. I just, I'm sitting there watching that clip. <laughs> And both of my mentors, uh, Colton Tudor and George Tarantini, had such unbelievable relationship with, with V mm -hmm. that I'm like, every once in a while, I remember one of the last conversations I had with George before he passed away. I said, I missed out on V, didn't I? And he was like, oh, man. <laughs> I go, do you think he would have hated me or do you think he would have loved me? And he goes, well, probably both. He goes, but man, he would have loved you. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll, I'll take that. So it tells that. me that he would have leaned into the Italian thing a lot. Oh, oh. Please, 
Yeah. But Tudor, Tudor's got some of the best, v, had some of the best V stories. That whole 83 run, man, mm-hmm. I should have recorded every, I, not all of it was suitable. I was going to say, how much of that, how much of that was actually arable? <laughs> like, do we, it's probably best for some things to just stay in the past, 83 right? 83 run, man. <laughs> God. Housekeeping. A little bit of housekeeping. We're going to be out at ACC kickoff in a couple of weeks. Our show structure is going to be a little bit different. Uh, because we're going to just be rolling through interviews and whatnot. So we'll, we'll give you some more details of what the record to get closer to ACC kickoff. Um, if you've emailed us about stickers, I have re- I've received those emails. I just ran out of stickers. I underestimated the demand. So uh, I mailed them out earlier this week. Uh, if you don't get them, it's because I just don't have enough, but I'm, I'm getting a re-up on some stickers here relatively soon. So just be on the lookout for that. Anything else we got going on? Um, well, we're in the process of getting a spot at the Wyndham Championship in August. Oh, I'm your dream. Forward to. Your dream. You've been wanting to I've go been to the Wyndham for a long time. To do, and yes, now have we to. have the ability to do that. So shouts to Rob Goodman and the Wyndham Championship down in Greensboro, Sedgefield. Also shouts to, to Brownlow's dad, man. I'm ready. Are we crashing at the Brownlow pad? Um, no, we won't crash, but there might be some we golf could. involved. Oh, I see. <laughs> we definitely have to have Randy on, too. So. <sighs> Brownlow will be mortified by that. <laughs> uh, although he, we'll talk about the Dolphins with him. Well, there's your housekeeping too. Next week, I'm 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 up to the Greater Tri-State area. Yeah. So uh, West Durham ACC Network ESPN is going to be hanging out with us on Monday. Brownlow. You think he can handle here. an hour? You think you think West can handle a whole hour of of programming? I think so. I, th- I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be fine. Um, I'm I'm afraid he's out of practice. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> No, he's doing serious XM. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. Part of the uh, part of the. I, I wanted to get him on this week to talk about some NFC South stuff, but he's like got serious XM. I'm like, all right, cool. It's all good. Not going to get away in that. And uh, yeah, but he'll he'll be here Monday, and Brownlow will be here Wednesday and Thursday of next week. Oh, another housekeeping note. I mentioned the stadium cups, the color changing yeah. stadium cups. I have figured out how to how to bring back the mixtape without breaking any. Well, let's work on our pronoun usage there. What's that? I have figured out. Well, I wouldn't execute it. So we got some people. I know you came up with the idea. So. <laughs> it's like, hold on, man. All right, you came up. We, 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 Lennon, we, McCartney. Thank you. <laughs> so um, it's going to, uh, I guess, in alphabetical order, it would be Julia Ovias. Huh? Regardless, so we have figured out how to do the mixtape, and we're going to have uh, some people come in and read lyrics. In a, in a unique way. And then you'll be able to email us what song that is. And then we'll be giving out. I think we should just invite somebody on. You think so? Yeah, we'll do it. Um, okay. We got these too. Thanks to Adam. Yeah. The breeze through. We just need to customize them. Okay. Okay. So we will be playing for. Now keep in mind, this is a breeze through, breeze through lifetime refill. So we're not just giving. The, the, the tumbler itself is nice. Oh, yeah. But you can take this to any breeze through and get a free refill for the All rest right. of your life. Okay. Okay. All Soda right. I'm or hype. coffee. I'm hyped. So we have five of those to give away. Five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We we have enough. Our audience, man, don't underestimate our audience. We we put out the call. We pick some people, have them on. We'll All invite right. them on, get them on. Okay. We'll have them listen. All right. Look, my, my idea was through email, but if you're convinced that we can actually get somebody to join us on StreamYard yes. and play this game. Yes. Absolutely. All right. All right. We'll see what happens. I'll, I'll, we'll do it when you get back. We'll do it live. We'll do it. Well, live at tape. Uh, shout out to Mosquito Authority and Pest Authority. It is the gross part of the summer, uh, but you still want to be outside. You want to grill. I mean, heck, that's what I'm doing later tonight. And I'll be firing up the Weber. And thanks to Mosquito Authority, the mosquitoes are kept at bay. This is the time of the year mosquitoes are pretty, pretty bad. I would hate to imagine my backyard without Mosquito Authority. And you can get that uh, as well. And you can also contact Pest Authority to uh, take care of all of your house needs. Yeah, anything inside, anything outside, ants, termites, you name it. Hayes Lancaster and his crew have you covered. Mosquito Authority, Pest Authority, you can call, give them a call, 919-807-1951. Or check them out at bugsbite.com. Also, shout out to Network for Entrepreneurs in Wilmington. Wilmington is one of the hottest areas in the country, not just the state, but in the country when it comes to startups. And you've had a lot of successful uh, exits, uh, whether it's something like Untapped. Uh, shout out to Jamie over at Breaking Tea. They're based out of Wilmington. And heck, we were talking about Shibumi Shade yesterday. 
And we talk about the beach. A lot of people want to go to the beach, but it's not just for the summertime. It's all year. And it's a great place to network, to be surrounded by other entrepreneurs and find ways to elevate your business. And that's what Jim Roberts at NEW does. You can check it out at newilm.com. Yeah. Find Jim on on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn mm-hmm. as well. He does such a great job with those groups down there. And it's been such a big supporter of ours. Appreciate him. Again, it's um, Network for Entrepreneurs in Wilmington. Next topic, please. So Matt Rule's back in the news cycle, Joe. Our old friend, our old Panthers head coach, now at Nebraska, Pete Thamel at ESPN. It's on ESPN Plus, so I didn't read the whole thing because I don't have ESPN Plus or, or I haven't unlocked it. Maybe I have it. I just don't know. But really, what what new am I going to get out of a Matt Rule profile at Nebraska? Let me guess. He doesn't take accountability for what happened in the Carolina Panthers, even though he was paid, what, $60 million or whatever it was to be the coach of the Panthers. But somehow, some way, he just he, he, he was just against all these obstacles that he just couldn't overcome. If he just had more time, Joe, or if they just listened to what he wanted to do, maybe things could have been different. But I believe the quote was, I have to go pull it up, but I believe the quote was that his experience with the Panthers was like a purifying fire. Is, did I read that right? Yes. <laughs> yes. That role was a terrible NFL coach. Yeah. And you, if, if you were paying attention to the signs beforehand, then you would have known yeah. that he was going to be a terrible NFL coach. In part because he liked to bring all the people from Baylor and Temple with him mm-hmm. as if he was still playing against Baylor and Temple's schedule. You might say, well, Joe, that's just not fair. Uh huh. Because at Baylor, he went 11 and three. Don't you remember? Of course. Everybody wanted Matt Rule. That was the fair sell. enough. The Giants wanted Matt Rule. That's, that's true. 11 and three. So, first year, the, the, the rule under rule was you burn it down the first year. Mm-hmm. One and 11 at Baylor. Seven and six, year two, you show that big improvement. You get everybody excited. And then year three, in fairness, in year three at both Temple and Baylor, he won double digit games. Mm-hmm. Okay. That is an accomplishment. But then you start looking at those numbers and you're going, well, who did he really beat at Baylor? His record against teams with a winning record that year. Let's let's throw out one and eleven. I don't yeah, even yeah. care about throw, one and eleven. Basically, okay? focus on the focus on the year that everybody points to after the teardown. Like here's yeah. the turnaround, here's where yeah. they're successful. This is okay. where Matt Rule sells so the, his vision. So he goes seven and six, and you're like, wow, they went seven and six. Oh, and four against top twenty five teams, one and six against teams with a winning record. Yeah. You go 11 and three. You're like, well, it's a little bit better, right? Yeah, sure enough. They went four and three against teams that finished with a winning record. Oh, and three though, against top 25 teams. So I'll ask you, has anyone ever milked more out of doing less than Matt rule? Because, and I know people want to scream about this, but temple was a terrible job. Yes. Temple was a terrible job before Al golden got there. Mm-hmm. The subsequent coaches all had six relative success. Mm-hmm. Yes. Temple was once so bad that they were kicked out of the big East. Yes. Yes. Look it up. Mm-hmm. But the truth of the matter is the program had been rebuilt by Al Golden. There's a reason why Al Golden was a hot name for a while and was the coach in Miami yes. because of his success at Temple. Fine. Also, his rule is the reason Golden's the Golden, a former Penn State football player is the reason that rule, a former Penn State football player was given the job at Temple. Mm-hmm. Okay. But again, tore it down, had the success, goes and takes the Baylor job. Baylor, you'll remember, was scandal rocked by Al, um, Art Bryles and all of the multiple r- very real issues that happened at Baylor. But what did Art Bryles do before all that? But before all of that, Art Bryles turned Baylor, very similar to Temple, mm-hmm. small private school, into a, a legitimate power. Mm-hmm. Okay. Unlike Temple, Baylor is in the state of Texas. And I will argue with you till the end of time that the reason the schools in North Carolina are the way that the schools in North Carolina are is because there's not enough players mm-hmm. to go to feed all of the teams who want to be good in this state. But most of the teams in this state get just enough good players to kind of prevent one team from being a superpower. Not the case in the state of Texas. There are stacks on stacks on stacks of players in Texas. And the proof of this is... Baylor being good, SMU being good, Texas Tech being good. I don't know what Texas's freaking problem is, but I can't solve all of the world's issues right here on this podcast. I would just say to you, the talent is such in the state of Texas that if you're competent, 
And I'm not suggesting that Matt Rule's not competent. I'm just suggesting he's not great. Yeah, I don't think that he's... you can win at a school like Baylor. And fair enough, he did. Yeah. But I, I just want you to look again at what he what he actually did at Baylor. He really didn't actually beat anybody good. No, and and that's a, a good chunk of college coaching is based on beating up on teams you know you can beat. And I'm, again, I don't want to completely dismiss Matt Rule because there is something to be said for taking care of business against teams you should be yes. taking care and he, of. And he could not do that with the Panthers. That was the but one thing a, he could not do. But, but let's, separate, let's separate college and pros, okay. okay? Because, you know, Urban Meyer found himself in that same situation. We've talked about that ad nauseum, right? Okay. Where you're, well, they, they were different. They're different. But, but they're, they're different but same in that you don't have the ability to schedule your way into a great season. In the NFL, right? Everybody's on the same level as you, so therefore, your ability to actually coach matters. You don't have to be a raw, raw guy. Matt Rule is a raw, raw guy, and this is the part that starts to bother me. Rather than just admitting that, look, my place is in college. There's nothing wrong with that. You can make a lot of money as a college coach in this era. All right, just look around. What was James Franklin making at Penn State? Could he make that in the NFL right now as a rookie head coach? No. no. So Matt Rule is set, man, at Nebraska because all that Big Ten money that's rolling in. But then he says stuff like this. This is from the Thamel piece that he had tweeted out. Going through the fire in Carolina was a purifying fire that melts away all the impurities, all the hubris, all the worrying about stuff that doesn't matter. I learned very much to worry about what matters. I have a focus and a desire in me. I watched what my kids had to go through in Carolina, and we're not going to let them go through that here. Well, what's he referencing exactly? What did his kids go through? Well, when you go to school and people tell you that your dad sucks. Okay, so what do you think that's going to be like in Nebraska? Well, he's very confident that he's going to... No, get, I'm sorry. He, well, now we, this all ties back to the, to the first segment then. If okay, where Nebraska is right now, are they going to be happy at ten and three? Well, here's my question: Are they? Here's the question: If the, they get the, there, the piece, the piece that I thought was interesting, and that Matt Rule doesn't view it as a rebuilding project. Yeah. Okay. Which I agree. They they you, had some lousy football luck this year. You've got two. You Let's got, just call it puck luck, since I like it when you say that. <laughs> you got two college football coaches going into the season that are going to be taking all the air out of the room for different reasons. Okay. You got Deion Sanders at Colorado, and you got Matt Rule at Nebraska. But they're taking the air out of the room for two reasons. Can't I, wait till they play. Oh, that's no, wrong ear. <laughs> yeah, wrong ear. <laughs> Speaking of my mindset. <laughs> Deion Sanders is going to be taking the air out of the room because the camera loves Deion and Deion loves the camera. And he's an amazing salesman for Deion Sanders. Right. And there's there's a reason why Colorado is going to find itself in some primetime games because people want to see the Deion Sanders experiment. I get the attraction. What I don't get with Matt Rule is how reporters find themselves gravitating to him. This is where I need you to explain to me like I'm five because I've never worked a beat, all right? And there's a different dynamic between... Well, they do play each other September 9th. Okay, well, that'll be interesting. Non-conference. So, yeah, I didn't have the schedule for me. So this is what I need for you to explain to me. What is it about Matt Rule that brings out these types of pieces from national writers? It's almost feel, It almost feels like access journalism at this yeah. point. When you're on, you know, like when you worked NC State beat for the News and Observer, you got a different Dave Dorn with the, than what the national Dave Dorn was, sure. right? And the TV guys were getting a different Dave Dorn than what we get in terms of a Dave Dorn. I'll never say that about Mac Brown because Mac Brown is Mac Brown every single time. It doesn't matter if he's talking to us. It doesn't matter if he's talking to a national guy. It doesn't matter if he's talking to a recruit. Mac Brown's Mac Brown. He's a pro's pro. There's a reason why everybody loves Mac Brown. But I see this. Oftentimes where people want to play the national and just assume that local will be behind you. But I'm telling you right now, if that rebuild stuff happens at Nebraska, they'll be patient in year one, but they better see that turnaround in year two. Otherwise, they're going to come after you they, because the expectations at Nebraska have never diminished, even though we they, understand. They burned Scott Frost. Right. Native son right. at the stake. So if you think you went through a purifying fire with an apathetic NFL town, what do you think it's going to be like at Nebraska, dude? Yeah, that's the part that I find funny. But Matt, Matt Rule is a college coach. And if you need further proof that he's a college coach and how this stuff will probably play in college, this, is, this clip is one of my all time favorites. Yes. I still don't understand 
what he's trying to say. There's there's a lot this of this delicateness. Scene, there's, there's, a, there's a scene. This is at a senior bowl, and he gives this a, is a, after as, his first year with the Panthers. He is now the coach at the senior bowl. Yeah, and the and the headline for this YouTube is Matt Rule gives great speech to top sure. NFL draft talent at sure. the senior bowl. I mean, you're coachable, right? Like some guys, you say something to them, and they're like, they want to argue. And they go, "Yes, sir, that's not coachable," and I do not want to coach that guy. Like, if you're not out here and every play, you don't want to be coached. Like if every play you're not trying to get better, okay. Saying yes, sir, does not mean you're coachable. Look at someone in the eye, having like football conversations with me yes. you're coachable. If every play you're perfect, then, then then we don't need to be at this game, okay. You should be coached on every play. I hope you respect the fact that the coaching staff is trying to coach you on every play. A lot of coaching staffs might have come out here and been like, man, let's just evaluate these players. We're trying to coach you, so get rid of get all that out of your system. I know your college coach was nice to you or something, but I don't care. Like, <laughs> like, like, let's freaking work at each other. The harder you get coached, the more we have to then coach, and you'll get better. <laughs> so let's try to get nine on six. Uh, 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 <laughs> it's I, no I, sense. We gotta hear that. Gotta, is ne- the harder you get no, coached, let's, let's hear it again. You'll get better. So let's try to get nine on seven punt and then team. Uh, we have to then coach. Uh, get coached. The harder you get coached, the more we have to then coach. He lied. He totally lied. And you know what, though? I feel it, man. Sometimes I get worked up. No, I get worked up. I'm not. I'm not gonna knock him. I'm not gonna knock him. Oh, by the I'm way, I'm gonna knock him because I think it's hilarious. Oh, look at that. Uh, it looks like the algorithm was working at some point in time as Matt Rule, one of our old videos, uh, ended up having like six thousand views. Anyway, just so far over his skis in every single situation. <laughs> Other than playing no, Texas I, San Antonio. I get where Matt, like, that's relatable for me and Matt Rule. You get so worked up. You, you think you're making this great point. Then you just kind of lose your words. Your, your mouth is moving at a pace faster than Actually, your brain. You Joe. cut it off before the best part of that whole video. And what was what? What was that? Because he talks. It begins with don't just say yes, sir. Oh, and then they, yeah. And then when he's getting ready to break, they yeah. all say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I, I, I need. Keep in mind. This is an old clip that we absolutely clowned when oh, it came out. It did, yeah. The year it came out. We have been right about Matt Rule every single step of the way. Yes. So do I think Nebraska will go seven and five this year? Absolutely. I think they'll have a winning record. Sure. He'll tell you how great he is. Yeah. Next year, they might even get to 10 wins. Maybe. 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 I haven't looked at their schedule. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Because I do think Nebraska, Louisville, Those are programs that have motivated fan bases. They have money. They have an invested community that I think can have success in the NIL era. Okay. Those are, those are programs I absolutely do believe in. Next topic, please. We were talking about breeze through earlier because Jillio's got that tumbler and we've found out a way to give out these tumblers with a mixtape. Uh, and they do have a growler station at the location by PNC Arena, Carter Family Stadium, that Edwards Mill location. But they have locations across North Carolina, and it is summer concert season. Maybe you're going to the Tears for Fear show this Saturday at Walnut Creek. Ooh. Drop on by. Everybody wants to rule the world. Just rule your tailgate. Okay? So that you will be head over heels by the selection at... Sorry, I'll, I'll keep going with this with Tears <laughs> for Fears. Anyway, the point being, you, you're going to find what you need at the breeze through, whether it's Great gas, which obviously you need to get to and from, but the snacks, the beer, food, all that kind of stuff, they get it at Breeze Through. There's nothing more more for me to add other than you know you're going to be by the arena real soon. Yes, you are. And right across the street there, all the things that you need, beer, they have. They got it. They got it. Also on Pool Road before you're going over to Walnut Creek. Yes, for sure. Yes, yes. Uh, Also, shout out to Butcher's Market. Uh, The Butcher's Market has uh, five locations across the triangle. It is prime grilling season. Uh, you've heard us talk about their marinated steak tips. I think most people understand that that is, uh, that's money, but they got a bunch of other great stuff too. Sandwiches. If you're thinking about something for lunch, oh, you don't are get me hungry. You're Come stuck on. in a rut. You don't know what to have for lunch. What do I do? Go to a butcher market. Turkey provolone. It's money. So good. There's like a fig something on there and it's, see, I've had like the cheese jam. steak. I've had the cheese steak from there. No, no, no. The steak and cheese is unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. First of all, it's not a cheese steak. I'm sorry, steak and cheese, my bad. Because that implies it's the chopped up yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff. Totally not that. No, no, no. This is the sir, this You're is right. sirloin tips. You're right. That they're cutting up and then putting in a sandwich with unbelievably delightful yes. melted cheese. The turkey and provolone, though, mm-hmm. ha- and, and and maybe I'm maybe I'm describing. It's like a jelly. It's like a jam that they use with the sandwich. It's so good. All right. All right. Oh. I have to go there today. Yeah, thebutchersmarkets.com. Locations in Raleigh, Cary, Holly Springs. Check them out, man. You can also join the Steak of the Month Club. That gets you a fresh, never-frozen hand-cut steak each month 
from July through December this month right now, 24 ounce T-bone. I mean, seriously, that's money. What are we doing? That's good. Come on. That's good. Also, shout out to Oak City Sports Guards, downtown Raleigh. Weston has a bunch of great items, uh, a lot of fun packs to open up all the, the latest and greatest things that I'm completely lost on. But if you're like an old timer like me and you think you've got something, you won't know unless you get it graded. That's the most important part. Yeah. Take what you have. Go check out West. And you might not know. It might be a garbage pail kid. It might be a Pokemon. You don't know. Uh, it might be a, an American Idol card. I'm telling you, Weston's got just about Excuse everything. Me? An yes. American. So yes. if I take like a Justin Guarini mint condition, I mean, you got to take my guy at least. Scotty, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Go check him out. OakCityCards.com. They're right there off of Glenwood Avenue. Such a great location. And yeah, um, did you find any humor that I got a, a Tony Grimes card in that college pack that I got? And I didn't see it. Oh, you got a Tony so I went back and I got the Bowman Chrome. Yeah. You you got a, you seriously got a Tony Grimes? I got, I got Josh Downs, which you know I was pumped about. No, I know. You know I, I know. love Josh Downs. I know you like Josh. But I also got Tony Grimes and I got Brendan Armstrong too. So oh, it, was, nice. it was a pretty cool set. It was a pretty cool box. This, this is what you wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. This was a 20 pack box. Mm -hmm. So I'll have, to, I'll have to bring some in and show you because you would like them. All put, right. Maybe put up, uh, I'll put Tony Grimes on the cork board. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. Perfect. What's up next? What's up next? Never knock Jillio's hustle. He found a way to... How many interns do we have now? We have two, technically, but once James gets to ECU, yeah. he'll also be... So we'll have three interns? Yes. Well, well, well we, we might lose calculus with Cal. Okay, but, well, intern, I mean, he's going to have a real life at some point. Intern Cal <laughs> is uh, in studio with us, and he truly is taking the intern mantle to heart. You brought us coffee, dude. You didn't have to do that. Of course, and breakfast. Um, he's like, so, let the record yeah, go. I <laughs> want to make sure that's on the table. <laughs> All right, that is, that is on the table. <laughs> so last week, when we were talking about quarterback height in relation to Bryce Young, we kind of got on a tangent about baseball. Of course. So you're a Yankee guy. Uh, As no, evidenced by your... What's up with the Yankee <laughs> jersey? No, yeah. I'm a Yankee fan. My family's from New York, so originally. So okay, they're not big baseball fans. So when I decided I like baseball, I had to pick either the Yankees or the Mets. You had to rep. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, nobody ever actually chooses the Mets, right? Well, I mean, mm. old, who older, fans who, Mets? older fans Island. who were Dodgers fans. That's what I'm saying. Well. You're born into that. Yeah. Like to me, to me, the Mets are kind of like NC State. You're born into right. Mets, being Jets. a Mets fan. Yes. Jets fan. You and I only know one person who is a strange Mets Giants fan. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to That's the Weezy. Weird All right. Shout out to the Weezy. It's, it is a weird combination. <laughs> yeah. And the reason why that combination exists is because apparently his parents did not give a damn about football. Oh. So it allowed him to pick his football team. And if given the choice, yeah. who would you pick? And they would have been long right. gone by then, too. Yeah. Once the Met, once the Jets left Shea, I I can actually see. Yeah. I, some I people being that. like, okay, well they're not the Long Island team anymore. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. So we gave you an assignment last week to talk about payroll. Yes. And the Mets, speaking of which, are <laughs> they're they're going through it right Ooh, now. Steve yeah. Cohen, the owners, had press <laughs> and conferences. he's going through it too. I love it. Yeah. I I think it's <laughs> not in a bad way. It. No, I'm with you on yeah. this. I think it's actually great that he's open about this. He'll tweet. He will hold a press conference. He will say, yeah, this is unacceptable. So in, in a lot of ways, I'm happy that he's breaking Major League Baseball's money situation. The owners are mad. I love that he makes other owners mad by spending money. And I love that he's open about the fact that, yeah, we've screwed up. We're not good right now. I love that the spotlight in terms of mediocrity is not on the Yankees. Mm -hmm. Like Because mm -hmm. we, could we be. are mediocre. <laughs> yeah, the, right? yeah, the so Yankees are. The Mets doing worse. Are. It's great. So I gave you this, uh, I gave you this, this assignment. And you can with the pronoun usage. At what? some point, man. What? I. I was. I'm pretty sure I was the one who gave him the assignment. You brought. Yeah. yeah I, I, I called uh, him. I called him your okay, we intern. We might have to check the film. We will have to check the film. <laughs> I called him your intern. What's he give me hours? No, it's your intern. Because <laughs> you want a car too. You want. I want a car. You want a car. A company. A company car. Next yes. thing you know, we're gonna yeah. have. We're gonna have a net jet. I mean, nice. but no, I don't like flying. You don't like much. flying? Okay. No, no, no. So we're, not, are we going to get a Are we, we going to get a Madden cruiser then to take us to various? We should. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't understand why you think it's so outlandish. I think it's outlandish. I think All it's outlandish. Right. Regardless, well, another day. We gave you an assignment. Jillian's going to break me of this. <laughs> there we go. He's going to break me of this. So we gave you an assignment. What is the Major League Baseball highest payroll to underperform? And I think we're witnessing history. Is that what I'm getting? We are witnessing history. So the 
there's a very interesting breakdown in these stats um, that happens at about 2000, where teams sp- start spending a lot more money. Mm-hmm. But you know, even with that in mind, uh, yes, we are witnessing history. The 2023 Mets, uh, in terms of the amount of millions of dollars they've had to spend per win, um, you know, they've spent 0.2 million dollars per win. So uh, that is by far the lowest. The only other team that is kind of close is the 2017 Tigers, mm-hmm. which interestingly enough also featured Justin Verlander. So, um, <laughs> you know, thread. I don't know if he's the problem, <laughs> huh. but uh, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a bunch of uh, so you're Dodgers blaming Yankees Verlander for this too. I mean, there's a bunch of Dodgers <laughs> Yankees teams, so you know, I can't exactly blame him completely. Okay, but it's just a weird. It's a weird coincidence. And that is an interesting coincidence, to say the least. Yeah. Now, in terms of... All right, so you... You did wins per million. Wins per million. So... And you also adjusted for inflation. I did adjust for inflation, yes. Okay. So... Yeah, cast that, that around. That, that just kind of gets everything to, you know, uh, to even even basis there. So, but, uh, all right, so you have a post-2000, mm-hmm. pre-2000. Why? Yes. Because um, it, I, I couldn't really spotlight what the exact historical reason was, but I have a couple of guesses. So... In 1998, 1999, payrolls just skyrocket. And, mm. you know, the obvious explanation would be, you know, the business of sports and entertainment, you know, increases as the turn of the 21st century happens and contracts get big. And say television contracts. Yeah, yeah exactly. that matters. Right. Um, and, you know, the specific reason I would argue as a Yankees fan would be the fact that the Yankees were so good and repeated that, you know, everybody else felt like they had to compete. So they started spending more money. I'm not sure how legitimate that is. But anyway, um, after... Well, two- no, well, but wait a second. There might be something to that in terms of when the Yankees created the Yes Network. Remember, mm-hmm. they were the first. They were their the own first, network. Yes. And then all, all, they, all they did was basically have a regionalized cable deal. So there's nothing. there was nothing preventing the Reds from having a regionalized cable deal. There's nothing preventing these other teams from having their own hustle. So I do yes. think there is something to what you're saying there yeah. and that it was spurred by the Yankees and their success, but also the Yes Network. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Yankees have just spent by far so much more money than than any other team historically. The Dodgers kind of come close, but the Yankees are kind of uh, there's a lot of entries on that list of the lowest wins. And they haven't won it since '09, unfortunately. Because we're talking about two different things here, right? We're mm-hmm. talking about actually winning the whole thing, winning, and and having a winning team, yes. mm-hmm. like which we would all consider the Rays to be a successful franchise at this mm-hmm. point, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, but of course. they haven't won the World Series. But yeah, it's all. Relative. It feels like the thread of, of today's show, and that is what is success, and what is acceptable, and, and what do we think of as success? What do we define as success? Yeah, I do think right? it's, it is all relative uh, mm-hmm. to your organization, and it's relative to your own history, and it's relative to how much money you're going to be spending as well. Steve Cohen, the owner of the Mets, clearly wants to win, and he feels that spending a bunch of money is the way to do it. But how many times have we seen instances where you spend that amount of money, and it doesn't necessarily you don't mean get the return? You're going to get that return. Just because you spend a lot of money doesn't mean you're making good decisions, all right? And I think that's what kind of bothers me with how we talk about sports in this day and age and that we correlate money spent on success. Speaking of college football, we get obsessed over the amount of money that's being made in the SEC. Well, you brought up Texas to tie it back to Matt Rule and Texas and the amount of talent that rides in Texas. They've gone through how many coaches since Mac Brown left? And they haven't been able to get any traction. At least, right? Right. And even at the end, Mac Brown was kind of bumping up against it because of maybe yeah. misfiring on talent evaluation or the, Not the right quarterback out of the state of Texas. That yes. kind of that kind of matters too, <laughs> right? Issue. So Texas has all the money in the world, and yet how many college football playoff appearances do they have? Zero. Bingo. So I I I wish we would break ourselves of this mindset that if you spend a bunch of money, Carolina Hurricanes are a good example of this too. There's a difference between being a cap team. And then being smart with the money that you're spending. Well, we should and also, weaponizing the cap. Too, we should also the way point that doing. out with Major League Baseball. Mm-hmm. There's no salary. Cap. There is no salary cap. There's a, there's a luxury tax, <laughs> but but yet, there's no. But yet, yet, and yet though, baseballs had the most variety of champions yes, though in the last true. twenty years, right? And funny, those, right? Those teams always operate within a certain bracket in terms of wins per million. It's between about like point three and point eight or so. Mm-hmm. So they are definitely spending a lot of money. But it is notable that, you know, the Dodgers have won World Series victory, you know, since or for forever. And the Yankees, you know, won the last time in 2009. And they're the two highest spending teams. So, um, yeah, a lot of variety and a lot of people are spending high levels of money. But there is a correlation between spending more and not being able to seal the deal and, and win the series. Joe, will you pull the chart up back real quick? Just because I want to illustrate one point here. Mm-hmm. from So, Cal... 
calculus with Cal here. Cal, our intern. The number one team is the Pirates. Get, and I can't see it, Joe. With that, it, you're, oh, you're too small. You, you want me here. to? It, oh, it's not the first time I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the 87 Pirates, yes. you're saying, are the most in terms of wins per million. Yes. The 87 Pirates are the most efficient economic team in the history of baseball. They or at are, least back to 84. They are the most efficient economic team. And that's what's interesting about this stat is because they blow away every single other team. They have seven wins per million spent. The next closest is like 6.4. So they are by far, like you said, Joe, the most economically efficient team. But they came fourth in the NL East in that year, 1987. They, so they didn't no, even come close to the playoffs. At the time, there was no wild card. No. Yeah. It was all divisional winners. They wouldn't have even come close to the wild card, even at that point in time. They got like 60 wins or something like that. So the there's there's a it's it's almost like a like a like a bell curve, mm -hmm. right? Where the less you spend, you're pretty much guaranteed to not be successful, even if you have a high wins per million. But the more you spend, there's a little bit less of a correlation there. Um, so found found that pretty interesting, which is why you know it's helpful to kind of look at those numbers from the perspective of before the turn of the century and after the turn of the century, just to get some context. Okay. But, it's also important to note that in 1980s, so they they went 80 and 82, okay, right? Yeah. That's the they go 80 and 82. The Cardinals went 95 and 67. The Mets, who had an, one of the all time teams, went 92 and 70, didn't make the playoffs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's important to note, though, like the most, and this this gets me back to the Moneyball point where people were like, "Okay, cool, you, you went and got Hattie Berg, and he likes to walk, and you worked the count, and all this other crap." Yeah, but you had these pitchers on a on a team friendly deal. Yeah, and they were really good pitching. Yeah, you look at the eighty seven Pirates, you go, "Well, wait a second, who was on the eighty seven Pirates?" And you know my opinion of Barry Bonds. Truth of the matter is, Barry Bonds is the best. Is the best all around baseball player in history. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. In history. Not gonna in Major League Baseball history. Yeah. So you basically had Barry Bonds on an entry level deal. So of course you are the right. most yeah. economically yeah. efficient yeah. team of all time. You have the most talented player, not quite at the peak of his height, at, at the peak of his powers yet, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, where he was about to produce. I'm not even talking about the crazy post steroid numbers. I'm talking about what he actually did with the Giants when he, with the uh, Pirates. When he was an MVP, he was an all-star and all those good things. Yeah. It's just kind of funny to me though. Like Cal knew nothing about that, right? He just he was just spitting out the number. Mm -hmm. And it's just all it's funny to me to put those numbers in context. Pitching's actually a really interesting variable. Um, like the the more um money saved on like high quality pitching is huge, even now, uh, more significant than other positions by far. Because I mean, you look at the 2012 Giants, I think it was the 2012 Giants who won the series, and they uh Madison Baumgartner they had him on a good contract. And they had a pretty high amount of wins per million. Like they spent less money overall, but they were able to get the job done because they had high quality pitching because that's where they chose to allocate their money. I think you can make the same argument for the Rays with McClanahan in particular. I was just say it feels like where the Rays are, yeah. are really making their hay right now in pitching. And it seems like yeah. every year they lose a pitcher, then that pitcher yeah. goes away and then they, they're not that good. Yeah. I, I would Wait, love. I would love you, for the race to win. Are you saying pitching matters in uh, baseball? I'm saying look at all of the Yankees. I was, the, you know, the number one thing I was excited about a for streak, the Yankees a streak this year is only as good as the next day's pitcher. Yeah, but you know I, how excited I was that the Yankees actually went out and got Carlos Rodon. Yes, and now of oh, course yeah, with the injury and not being able to see him pitch, yeah. and I don't know how effective he's going to be. Yeah, it's just like I'm watching the playoffs last year. They they ended up beating the Guardians, but I'm watching. I'm looking at the Guardians bullpen and I'm going, why do the Yankees not have a bullpen that looks like this? It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense to us either. Uh, you know, Aaron Boone, you know. Yeah. Well, he should be gone. I was yeah, going to say, Joe over there was like, no, I got have patience with, yeah. with Aaron Boone. Last year, I'm ready to fire his ass. Yeah, you, like, were no, no, no. yeah you were ready to fire his ass. Yeah, you were ready to fire his ass. I mean, hey, but hey, at least you have the home run king, right? The true. Exactly. The true. King of the North. Home, yeah. <laughs> On that note, we're out of here. Uh, Cal, appreciate the coffee and the breakfast, man. Of course. Okay. Do we, do we, have, do we have another assignment for Cal? Well, you can give him assignment for next week. Okay. All on your own. Since I will not be here. All Maybe right. there is something to recruits in the state of North Carolina compared to Texas or mm, that'd be interesting. Florida, or maybe you can do something else. Maybe there's a three star, four star, five star correlation. Ooh. Mm. All of that's on the 247 site. So it is. All right. Well, here we, here's here's our, our assignment for in you. Real time, in real time. Okay. Here's our second assignment. week in a row. We'll we'll do this next week. <laughs> But on the record, Joe's giving it to me this time. Joe, Joe, Joe Ovius. Yeah, yes. yes. We yeah. collectively <laughs> have decided this uh, during this segment. Um, let's see who's had the most college football success in the state mm -hmm. based on stars. So, fewest amount of stars, 
most success. Cool. I think that's a development issue. Like you're turning okay. guys. I think I think it'll be an interesting correlation of who's actually developed players mm -hmm. versus who's brought in talent. So you sure. can probably only go back to like 00 or 01 or 02. I mean, that's fine. We got to remember it's, numbers. it's yeah. 2023 now. That's, uh, a, that's still 20 years of data. It's you're 20 right. years of data. You're man. Right. Like we have to, we, you and I especially I know. have I to get know. out of this mindset that the year 2000 <laughs> was, was just five years week. ago. <laughs> no, no, no. The year 2000 no, was I know. 20, 20 years ago. All right. So somebody like Cal, he's ancient history he's like who's this philip rivers person I, I, I started following sport 2007 I, I know i know my stuff i remember my patriots beating phil rivers oh, the AFC championship okay. and then lower patriots get out of here how many uh, yankees jersey on him it's a complicated as a complicated legitimate answer uh, we're moving on i love that we have an intern show here we go is that better i'm proud of you you're gonna, break, you're gonna you're gonna break me out of this. You're gonna you're gonna break me out of this. Let's answer some hey Joe questions before we get out of here for the weekend. Brought to you by Oakwood Pizza Box. Check them out online at oakwoodpizzabox.com. Drop on by, say what up to Anthony. He is the straight up best. I guess it's we're in a college football kind of mood today. Uh, from John, hey Joe, when state when is state going to give Dave Doran the recruiting budget with money we have, by the way. The alumni isn't exactly broke. Well, put a pin in that, John. Uh, to get players <laughs> to compete for an ACC championship in order to win, uh, you got to... Uh, I think he's saying you have to Google out of NC. Yeah, okay. In order to win that, you have to cut or NC... Or anyway, so what's the opinion? Who's to blame the 80s, the boosters, the budgets? Wow, there's a, there's there's a lot here. There's a lot of layers to this, John. A lot of layers to this. We just said, though, that money... Yeah. The one thing that Dave Dorn has done really well is identify players and develop them. That's the key part. Um, they've also, he's also done a good job of getting quarterbacks out of the transfer portal. Mm -hmm. <sighs> the one thing he hasn't done is take advantage of the opportunities that he's had. Yeah. Whether it was 17 when Clemson was quote unquote down, whether it was 21 when Clemson was down, mm -hmm. whether it was last year. When Clemson was susceptible, uh, each time I keep saying Clemson, you know, there there are years where you have an opportunity, you have to take advantage of it. They haven't done that. I don't think that's because of recruiting budget. Uh, I think part of it has been offensive coordinator and play calling. I think part of it's been bad luck too. You know, I I don't I don't think that's something that will be fixed. Well, maybe by, that's just maybe that's just dollars. you say bad luck. I mean, we just we started the we started the show talking about Dick Sharon and his best team in 1991, and who they lose to in the Peach Bowl. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like yeah, sometimes ECU on the last play basically. again. I just kind of get back to this is this is life for about 98 percent of yeah. or 99 percent of college football programs. Uh, as far as money, NC State is different from a lot of other schools. In no that, doctors, no lawyers. Man. Yeah, state states, and this is a this is a credit to. The former head of the Wolfpack Club, Bobby Purcell. Bobby Purcell, who figured out, and it's funny how everything old is new again, because we talked about this a couple shows ago when it relates to NIL and how there are schools that are now sell selling memberships. It's, it's kind of like an OnlyFans for college football, right? And they get a lot of they get a lot of money, a little money I'm from sorry, a lot a, of people. Yeah, a little money from a lot of people. And Bobby Purcell was the one who got that yes. going at NC State, and why the Wolfpack Club is one of the best booster clubs out there. And now other schools have kind of figured this out. So, yeah, when you look at other places, there's a lot of lawyers, doctors, you know, entrepreneurs that have come out and have given back. NC State doesn't necessarily have that, but they have a motivated fan base and they can they, they can tap that in. Uh, from Nick, hey, Joe, are you all going to add Bomani to the OG network since the sad news about game theory? I'd love a monthly game theory style uh, streets uh, guy in the streets segment about triangle sports. Really like it weekly, but that's too much to ask. Yeah, Bomani's show, uh, Game Theory on HBO, was uh, canceled after two seasons. And I've talked to Bomani about it, and you know he he kind of understood where things are going. And I think it speaks more to what happened to Bomani happened to us, and what happened to what 17, 20 different people. You know, guys that we've been friends with, like Jordan Cornett at ESPN, uh, Jason Fitz, who I've gotten to know over the years on the radio side of things, you know, good people, talented people who give a damn. Unfortunately, the nature of the business is uh, the best way to make your bottom line look better is to gut a bunch of salary. Uh, and there's an overcorrection that's taking place right now in the industry that's happened here locally. And now it's happening uh, for a lot of these content creators because, you know, it's ultimately sinking. You know, it's 
everybody was convinced that ESPN was like an albatross for for Disney. And ESPN is actually doing pretty fine, all things considered. They've gotten leaner. They've gotten meaner. They've got the games, which ultimately matters. And that's why they can keep clearing the, the, the carriage fees that they do on cable. You know what's actually screwing Disney right now? Streaming. They've sunk all this money into original programming and not enough people are watching it. Amazon recently read a story the other day about how Amazon executives are going, why are we spending billions on this content that nobody's watching? There was this big lead up to Lord of the Rings. Nobody really watched it. Apple keeps sinking money into content that people aren't necessarily watching. So there's this big overcorrection that's taking place. Even Netflix has found this situation to be true. And you're seeing the overcorrection and unfortunately people's livelihoods are being affected by it. Just to be clear, Bamani is the smartest person I know. Yeah. Just to be clear. Yes. Bamani does not need us. He will be fine. He'll be just also fine. to be clear. We owe Bamani for all of the times that or all the time that he has spent with us mm -hmm. on all forms of this program. Yes. Because he truly makes us better every time every we talk time. to him. Yeah. So that being said, <laughs> anytime Bamani wants to come on and talk to us, as you like to say, when we get local bow, love local bow. You know, love local I, and, I, and I've said it before and I'll say it again. When we got fired, I only picked up the phone for one person mm -hmm. and it was Bowani. Yes. And I talked to him and it, made, it did make me feel better. So <laughs> yeah, we, we can't afford Bo. Uh, <laughs> no, we cannot. <laughs> from Andrew. And that's fine. He, 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 he commands what he commands. Uh, from Andrew. Hey, Joe, bottom of the bag for tortilla chips. And there are a few big ones. Are you one? Oh, wow. Trying to use them up. Two, just tossing the bag. Three, pouring salsa over the chips and using a fork to eat. I will try to use them up. I'm option number one when it comes to bottom of the bag tortilla chips. Sometimes I'll just get a handful of them and I'll just get messy in there. I'll get messy with the salsa and just shove it in my face. Depends on how old they are. Mm. If they're old, they're gone. Um, but I have done both. I, I I am the world's greatest nacho maker. I don't know if you know this. It's one of my fastballs. Better than Raleigh times? Yes. You make better nachos than Raleigh times? I do. I feel like we have to have a taste test now. Well, I mean, just saying. you know, Okay, I have I have my own personal bias, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yes, you know one of my you, skills. Wings, you know who you sound like chili. Yeah, nachos. Yeah, these are these are my these are this your, is my wheelhouse. wheelhouse. Yes, you sound like gold right now. Yeah. Adam Adam Gold uh, once Adam lost me one time. Was, I make the best peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> that's what he, that's well, what he lost they're... me. Well, oh, you're just putting ingredients on the nachos. Right. I mean, what are you really doing with nachos? I mean, I can tell you I make the best nachos. Yeah, but one time Gold lost me because he's like, I make the best peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I'm like, it's a PB and J. <laughs> like, how complicated is that? Is he sprinkling honey? I mean, what are you doing? We're sprinkling crack on it? Like, I don't know. But uh, maybe that's the that's the thing. But you know, love Adam. He's always the best at everything. From Jonathan, hey Joe, thoughts on the Big Ten looking to potentially add ACC schools like Miami and UNC? How do you feel about traditional ACC rivalries like Duke and UNC being split up by conference realignment? I mean, this is something that's been going on throughout the summer. I'm guessing it'll pop back up again once you get to ACC kickoff. And I, I think I think people have finally come around, Joe, to a point that we've been trying to make as it relates to conference realignment. How you thought about things in 2005? do not apply to how things operate today and why conferences would be interested in bringing on a school. The biggest brand that the Big Ten would want to bring on is UNC. It would not be Miami. And I don't think Duke and Carolina are going to be split. Uh, if it were to the Big Ten, I think it would be a package deal because the Big Ten does value basketball in a way that the SEC might not. And they look at it from a, how can we clear as many homes as possible? I mean, a Duke Carolina game on the Big Ten Network obviously wouldn't do that, but Fox would be interested in airing that, right? So that that's why I think it's a package deal. But I feel like that's thankfully died down here, maybe until next summer when we got nothing else to talk about, right? So as for now, everybody as as Mark Anna said uh, from Louisville, he's like, y'all just need to get comfortable because nothing's happening yeah. for another seven years. Again, or so. I'm I'm genuinely interested in what happens with Texas and Oklahoma. Because yeah. they're not primarily motivated by financial reasons. No. Obviously, NC State, Miami, um, Clemson, Florida State, those will all be schools that you go, well, they're, they 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 want it. Virginia Tech, mm -hmm. they want to do this to say to stay competitive and stay financially solvent, mm -hmm. right? If Texas and Oklahoma get to the SEC and do not make the playoff in however many years of, of data we get. I don't know how Clemson and Florida State can look themselves in the mirror and be like, you know what I really need to do? I really need to go join a league where we reduce our chances 
of having the ultimate success. And I get the financial implications. I, I hear Florida State's athletic director saying we can't be $30 million behind. Maybe you can be. Again, you're in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. So this gets back to who you have access to and your what your recruiting base is. Uh, again, it all comes back down to what matters to you. Does winning the national championship matter to you? And at Florida State and Clemson, it absolutely should. Yeah. Next up from Daniel. Hey, Joe, what's your favorite thing about working from home? Least favorite. I don't like working from home. Yeah, neither do I. I never have liked working from home. No, I hate it. Um, and I understand that th- <laughs> it's almost like there's two separate conversations. If I worked a normal nine to five, all right, if I had like a normal job, I think you and I both understand that we don't have normal jobs. Correct. We've never had normal jobs. Correct. So this idea of a nine to five lifestyle is foreign to me. I don't know if I would ever do well at it. It'd probably drive me nuts. So if I worked a normal nine to five, I would probably be inclined to want to work from home. I could probably be more productive from home. Yes. The reason why there's this drive to get people back in the office is because lease tenant rates are expensive and they're just sitting there empty. So it's, damn it, we're going to use these things. Plus it's a level of control too. There's this idea that people are less productive at home. It's actually not true. People are pretty productive at home. But I am not built that way. You know, like I need to be moving. I need to be doing different things. I got a weird schedule about the day and how I go about things. Come in, record, do some work after, run an errand, do some more work later. I'm all over the place. You're the same way. You and I are very similar in that we're restless. Yes. (laughs) We have to be out and about doing stuff. So being at home does not do well for us. No. No, thank you. No. Um, I hated doing the show from home. Oh, hated doing the show from home. Gross. When the pandemic hit, we had to do the radio show from home. You hated it. You're doing it from the bathroom. Ugh. I was doing it from my wife's home office and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. Um, I had a routine. Yeah. And I like going into a studio. That's why I was really happy to like actually have a studio space, like be in front of you to mm-hmm. do this, you know? Uh, so shout out to, uh, to Greg and, and the entirety of Empire Properties for working with us on this studio space here in downtown Raleigh. That's going to wrap it up for this week of shows. Hopefully everybody enjoyed it. Thanks to everybody who's thrown five stars on it who has hit the like buttons, the subscribe buttons on YouTube, and of course, the social media love as well. All that stuff matters. So we thank you for that. Have fun in New York. Thank you. You bringing me back some pastrami? No. Bagels? No. Gummies? Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back smelling like weed? Potentially. Because on every block? Yes. See you then.